Thank you. I know you guys are all very busy and um, I know you value your time, so I'm not gonna take up too much of your time. I'm gonna do the best that I can to uh, offer some valuable information, but most importantly, what I need from you guys is to know what you need, what, know what you wanna learn about. And I don't claim to know everything, but I'd like to be able to fill in at least a couple gaps, uh, maybe uh, raise some questions, maybe question what you think you know, question what you're doing now, and maybe make you improve at even 1%. Uh, and that's really what the objective is, right? I'm not here to claim that I know everything. I'm not here to claim that my way is the best way. What I'm trying to do is stimulate a thought process. So I want you guys to all leave here, and, and every time you step in the gym, think about what you're doing. Rather than getting in that habit of doing what you've always done because you're, you're good at it or because it feels comfortable, that's probably the worst paradigm to exist in life, right? If you want to be great at something, the best way to do it is find the weakest link and make it better. Whereas most people have this great tendency to continue doing what they're already good at and get better and better at it. And the weaker, weakest link gets weaker and weaker and the strengths get stronger and stronger. And then what happens? Injuries, right? So this is kind of why these guys brought me out here is to tie all these things together for you. Um, and just make you start to realize that you're only as good as your weakest link, right? We have a, we have a 10 link chain, all of them are hundred pounds. Then we got this one little 10 pound chain, uh, chain link over here. If that, what's gonna break? If, you, if you're trying to put as much tension as possible through this chain, what's gonna, what's gonna happen? The weakest link is gonna snap. So it's very important that you guys pay attention to that and always objectively assess. How can I make this better? So always objectively step back, take a snapshot of what you're doing and, and notice what's the weakest link. And that's, the thing, that's something I've always done in my career is always taking the approach of, well, what's the weakest link? So if I'm doing a leg press and my lower back is hurting first, what's the chance I'm gonna build my legs? If, if I'm doing a leg press and I'm out of breath first, what's the chances I'm gonna build my legs? Right? If I'm doing squats and I'm gassed and I can't, get, I can't fatigue my quads, what's the chance I'm gonna build my legs? Same thing at anything you do, right? If you're doing a back exercise and your arms are hurting first, that muscle, those muscles are fatiguing first. You're never gonna to get to those big underlying muscles you're trying to train because there's a weaker link in the chain. The only way to make a muscle truly respond and grow is to make it the weakest link in the chain. So the most important thing you can do is set up properly for an exercise so that you eliminate the likelihood of anything else breaking first, right? So we want that muscle that we're trying to train to be the weakest link and once it is, and once we know that it's getting fatigued first, that's when effort and intensity comes in, right? It doesn't make sense to inflict maximum effort and intensity arbitrarily on your body if muscular development is your goal, right? If I'm, trying to, if I'm just trying to train hard because I want to train hard, if I want to be Tony, who's just a beast, then we just train hard. But if our goal is hypertrophy, if our goal is trying to build muscle, which I'm going to assume if you're here, that's something you want to learn about. Um, so I should make that statement is if we're training for strength, all this stuff that I'm saying doesn't apply. If I'm training for athletics, all the stuff that I'm, I'm saying, it's not that it doesn't apply, it's that it's not as specifically related to that population. So the stuff I'm talking about today is like if I'm trying to hypertrophy a muscle, the only way I'm going to hypertrophy that muscle is if it's the weakest link in the chain, I find it and I'm just able to, to hammer on it once everything else is no longer going to be the limiting factor. Make sense? Um, so one of the things that I want to drive home to you guys is I don't advocate lightweights. You know, this is a misconception. A lot of people, I don't want you to stop training the way you're training. I don't want you to stop training hard. I just want you to pick and choose where you go hard and make sure the muscle that you're using is the one you're actually trying to build. That's important, right? If you're in here arbitrarily training hard, that's awesome, but you're creating a whole bunch of other negative responses in your body, even though you think it's a positive response, arbitrarily training hard is doing what to your body? What is training actually doing inside your body? It's causing stress, it's causing damage, it's causing inflammation, it's causing cortisol, right? We know that. Acutely, those are really good things, but too much and too often does everything in the opposite direction of what you're trying to do. So what we're trying to do for people who are trying to build our best physique is selectively stimulate the muscle we're trying to train and allow it to respond, allow it to hypertrophy with the minimum possible negative side effect. Makes sense, right? If I'm, if I'm causing too much cortisol, too much inflammation, too much metabolic stress, 
my body is not going to be in a position to grow. Growth is, is a super physiological state. If your, growth, if your body is trying to recover from the extreme damage you've just subjected it to, growth isn't even anywhere on the radar. Growth is so far down the, the list of priorities, your body goes, forget that, I gotta heal this first. That doesn't matter. So the, the more specific we can make training, the more specific we can make uh, lifting a load to a specific muscle, the better it's gonna be, both short-term and long-term. If anyone's ever had a hard time getting in shape for a bodybuilding show, what's the only thing you do? Well, I just work harder. That's what everyone says. Is that the best solution? We've all been there, myself included, where it's like, the only thing I got left to do is work hard. I'm working so damn hard, I'm doing all this cardio, I'm doing all this training, my body still doesn't want to respond. That's a bad place to be. Why does that happen? You're in a massive caloric deficit, you're training your ass off, you're out training everybody, doing twice as much work, twice as much volume, twice as much intensity. What happens? Your body just goes, uh-uh. Why? Cortisol, inflammation, insulin resistance, from too much training, non-specific training. So your body is systemically inflamed, body doesn't have a chance to build muscle or lose fat. Okay, so what we're trying to do with this intelligent approach to training is selectively stimulate muscles. So this is why we're here to learn about this stuff. And as I said briefly, the absolute most important thing you can do, I don't know how deeply I want to dive into this today because I don't want to keep you guys here for too long. I really want to take you out there and show you this amazing benefit you have, this amazing opportunity you have with this new equipment. Um, but but the, the most important thing you're going to do for any exercise out there, this is something I teach all the time, is the way you set up for an exercise is going to make all the difference all the difference. Um, so how you set up has to advantage the muscle you're trying to work. That's really important. I'm not going to talk about that anymore in here. I'm going to show you how to do it up there. The next thing I want you guys to realize, the second most important thing, and this is the, the, the order is kind of arbitrary, but the second most important thing is you got to make sure the muscle you're trying to work is doing the work. And momentum and inertia is a big part of exercise these days, right? We see a lot of people, especially in this gym, who train with a lot of momentum, a lot of inertia. Does that contribute or does that take away from progress? The answer is it depends. If I'm trying to build muscle, my goal, my exclusive goal, if I'm trying to build muscle, everybody listen to this, this is important. I have one goal if I'm trying to build muscle. I'm trying to make this as hard as possible for this muscle. I want to challenge that muscle as much as possible, right? Does doing this hard for that my muscle? At what part of the exercise is that muscle challenged? About here. So if I want to make an exercise as hard as I possibly can for myself, what should it look like? What would it look like? Anyone, somebody raise their hand, I'm gonna pick on you. If I wanted, if I wanted to make an exercise like as hard and as excruciatingly possible as as I could for a muscle, what would it look like? Tension. Give me more specifics. I want, I want you to like get into it, feel it. What is it? What does it look like? If I'm doing a leg extension, if I'm doing a squat, how can I make a squat as hard as I possibly can for myself? Like I want you to just throw out answers. Heavy. heavy, maybe. Heavy is a good thing. Heavy might work. Well, what would it look like? Yeah, constantly under tension would certainly be there. But would it be fast or would it be slow? It'd be as slow as you possibly. Like if I said everybody stand up, don't do it right yet, but like if I said everybody stand up and I had you do a squat that looked like this. Okay, now I'm gonna keep going down. Now would that be harder or would this be harder? Way harder, right? I'm trying to make it challenging to the muscle. That's not saying I don't want to load it. It's just saying I'm trying to strategically challenge the muscle at all parts that it's capable of being challenged. And if you guys can take anything, start that, try that. Is that the way you train all the time? No, no way is the way you train all the time. But you should realize the value in that because that's the one thing most people don't do, right? Is like most people when they're, they're thinking about an external focus, everybody has an external focus on how much load is on the bar or what exercise I'm doing. How could we shift that to create an internal focus. Where's our muscles, inside or outside? Inside the body. Muscles don't know what this is, right? You've heard this before, it's cliche. Muscles don't know what that is. Muscles just know end-to-end -end tension. Bone-to-bone -to -bone tension is what I'm trying to maximize. Well, how do I do that? 
how can I make this as hard as I possibly can for that muscle inside bone to bone? That's the objective of weight training. Is it putting more 45 pound weights on the bar? Does adding more weight to the bar automatically assume that the muscle I'm trying to train is gonna do more work? No. Never, never. Here's a fact. If I'm doing, here, here's an important thing. You guys are gonna hate me for this. Exercise is all physics, right? If any, I'm not, anybody ever study physics? Sucks, right? Terrible, horrible shit. But the reality is everything we do out there is physics. You know, it's all forces, it's all angles. So if I'm doing a 100 pound dumbbell press, let's say I'm doing a 100 pound dumbbell press and I'm doing 10 reps, tempo is completely irrelevant for my example. And my hands are directly over my elbows and I do 10 reps and I go, man, I was easy. I, could do, I can go up and wait. And I go to 110 and I take 110 and I go from here to here. And now I do 110 and I do 10 reps. Did my pecs work more or less? Somebody tell me. The same? The answer is likely less, but the answer is it depends. There's actually an equation in physics that you could figure this out. So the amount of tension or torque at that muscle is, everyone knows force is mass times acceleration. So everybody goes, well, mass, it's gotta be fast. Well, unfortunately, that's not true in exercise because exercise only happens in an arc. All of your joints in your body move in an arc, the equation for force, mass times acceleration, is in a straight line. So if you, if you want to start taking into account an arc, you have to start taking in, into consideration distance. Distance from the axis, which is half of the equation of, the, of, of torque. Half. Mass times distance. The, also, the other consideration is the angle at which it's applied, but in this case, we're going to assume that's going to be a machine. So it doesn't change, it's consistent. So it's mass, force, times distance. Anyone ever consider distance when they're training? Ah, sometimes, not often enough though, right? So let's say I'm doing this five pound dumbbell. How long can I hold it there? Probably all day. Joints are stacked. Zero distance from the axis. If I go here, how long can I hold that? A little less. How about if I go here? What changed? Same weight, really big distance. So in reality, you can actually measure how much heavier this is than this by measuring the distance from here to here. So I would multiply, so let's say, let's say arbitrarily that's 20 inches. That's gonna be 20 times the load here or here than it is here. That's literally 20 times more torque at this joint. That's a lot of distance, right? So when people throw more weight on the bar, but they do this, it's not your best opportunity to challenge the muscle that crosses that joint. Does that make any sense to anybody? Does that not make sense to anybody? Because I can keep going, I can explain a little bit. So if your goal is specifically to challenge that muscle, you have to acknowledge distance, and you also have to acknowledge something else. You also have to acknowledge that a muscle, every muscle, has a varying ability to generate force, has a varying ability to generate tension or torque at different parts of its range. Has so everybody ever noticed that in exercise, like certain parts are hard, certain parts are easy, right? So let's look at a squat. What part of the squat is hard? The bottom, why? You get to be my demo model, since we're friends. So just face that way. Uh, right there's good. Tell me your name again. Carlin. Carlin. All right. Everybody say hi, Carlin. <laughs> All right. All of it. You just face from. Carlin's going to be our gracious demo model. That's Carlin's center of mass. She has to balance over that at all times in her life or she'll fall down. It's just reality of life. We always balance over our center of mass. Got it? So when she's standing straight, it's, it's stacked through the middle of her foot, middle of her knee, her hip, and her shoulder. So Carlin, go into a squat three inches. Just down three inches. Stop. 
what happened? Her knee and her hip went a little further away from that joint, but her body still had to balance over that center of mass, right? Okay, go down a little further. You go down to 90. Good. So what happened? The distance from that center of mass where she would load it has increased from the knee and the hip. So that means these muscles are doing a lot more work there than they were when she was standing up. Pretty easy to see? Good, now come up real slow. Perfect, and you can see as she gets closer up to the top, they get closer and closer and closer to that center of mass, that axis of, or that, yep, there you go. And now there's like stack, there's like no load there, right? Pretty easy, she could stand there all day. That's important, thank you. That's important to acknowledge. Actually, no, I want you to do one more example. Okay. Since we like squatting so much, this is completely on tangent, but I want you guys to see this anyways. Is a squat an exercise for quads or glutes, or both? Which one? Which, one's, which one is the bigger mover? Glutes? Quads? Nobody's gonna give me the right answer. Come on, somebody throw it out there. Ah, what? Depends. No, okay, let's say back squat, both back squat. Is it a bigger, is it a bigger quad or a glute exercise? Max knows. Okay, so watch this guys, go back to your position. So what did I just say? We know that as the knee joint gets further away from this center of mass, it's gonna be harder. We know that as the hip joint gets further away from the center of mass, it's gonna be harder. But what if one moves away and the other doesn't? So I want you to squat back, I want you to squat down, but I want you to throw your bum back as much as, as, much as you possibly can. So squat hips first. Hips go first, keep just driving hips back. Keep going all the way down, drive hips back, slow, 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 slow. Hips back, hips back, hips back, hips back, hips back. Good, stop right there. Is that different than the first way she squatted? Yes. Notice how, further, how much further her hips are away? Does that mean it's harder for her hips there than it was the other way? Stand back up. Now let's do the opposite. Let's drive your knees as far over your toes as you can. Go down as slow as you can. Drive your knees out and drive them forward, 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 like uncomfortably forward. There you go. You keep your heels down. Good. Good, is that different? How is it different? So now this has a greater distance from that axis. So what is it? Thank you. So which is it? The farther your hips are back, the more glutes you're working. And the farther Thank you. You get to choose whether that's a quad or a glute exercise based on your execution. Who's ever thought about that before when they're, when they're, training, their, their, when they're training their legs? And if you haven't, maybe it's time. Right? Maybe it's time. If you have weak quads, anybody in here have weak quads? Yeah? Anyone here want a bigger glutes? Yeah? Maybe something to think about, right? Maybe I can just manipulate the distance from the axis and make this useful for me. Useful information. Interesting stuff, right?